if we only have 10 people here, this could just turn into <laughs> intimate experience? I've uh, been out to uh, Cornell uh, a couple times. Oh, okay. <laughs> you just have a beautiful Yeah. Um, you also never campus. know on the live stream these days. Enjoyed. I spoke to <laughs> Federal Society, I guess, pre-COVID. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. And I'm actually glad to be last time I flew to the airport. So, so convenient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to pedal the plane? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dean. Yeah. How are you? Good. Oh yeah, thank you, Dean. Welcome or welcome back as the case may be. I am still Dean Reuter still Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the Federal Society. I am happy to introduce our moderator for our next panel. And I do want to acknowledge that we seem to be a victim of our own success. Now that we're all back in person, everybody wants to uh, be in the hallways, in the promenade, and uh, ha have a little reunion out there. So thank you for joining us inside here. And again, welcome to the people on the live stream and, and watching the video. Uh, Trevor McFadden is, of course, a United States District Court Judge for the District of Columbia, where he's been on the bench since 2017. He's a graduate of Wheaton College and UVA Law School, a Judge Stephen Colleton clerk, and a two-time veteran of the U.S. Department of Justice. He's also been in big law, serving in private practice. Now, our panel today will discuss the ABA's role in policing law schools. And interestingly, Judge McFadden has on-the-ground experience in policing, a different sort, admittedly, but having served as a Fairfax County Police Department officer and the Sheriff's Office in Madison County, Virginia. So please welcome Judge McFadden. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> really good to be with you all um, this morning. I gotta say, you look tired. I see these, like, dark circles under people's eyes and like you're nursing coffee. Was there something happened last night? <laughs> Big game or something? Um, it's um, great to, to be with you all on an important uh, topic. As Dean said, we'll be discussing the ABA accreditation of law schools. Um, as you probably know, earlier this year, the ABA passed revisions to standard 303 which requires all of its accredited law schools to provide education about, quote, bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism at the start of each law school um, graduate or in incoming class, and at least once again before graduation. Um, it also includes uh, proposed revisions to standard 206, um, which will be voted on later this summer, um, which would be uh, uh, retitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Among other things, the standard would require representation of underrepresented groups, particularly racial and ethnic minorities, on law school faculties and staff, and it would require annual reporting by each law school on its representation of racial and ethnic groups. Um, it, it appears there would also be potential consequences for law schools, including presumably um, potential for uh, revocation of accreditation um, if the law schools fail to meet um, expected benchmarks. Um, these developments have uh, naturally re-raised interest in the uniquely powerful role the ABA plays in the American legal profession. As a practical matter, in many states, aspiring lawyers must attend an ABA accredited school in order to become a lawyer. Um, these standards, therefore, can have a direct impact on who will teach future lawyers, what these future lawyers will learn, and even who can become a lawyer. Um, we've got a great panel here to discuss these developments. Um, I'll briefly introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Um, and I think you have uh, their full biographies um, attached in the online materials um, if you would like to learn more. All right, um, first we have uh, Professor Derek Muller. He's Professor of Law at the University of Iowa. He's a nationally recognized scholar in the field of election law. He's testified before Congress, contributed to the Federal Election Law blog, and is a co-author on uh, a book on the federal courts, a textbook. 
He got his BA from Hillsdale College and his JD from Notre Dame. Uh, next to him is the Honorable Scott Bales. Um, uh, Justice Bales is a retired um, uh, Arizona Supreme Court Justice. He retired in 2019 after 14 years of service there, including five years as the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. He currently serves as an elected member of ALI's Council and recently was the Executive Director of the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal um, System at Denver University. Previously, he was Arizona's Solicitor General and um, he was a Deputy Assistant Attorney General and a former Assistant U.S. Attorney in the uh, U.S. Justice Department. Um, Justice Bales clerked for Justice O'Connor on the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Joseph Sneed on the Ninth Circuit. He graduated from Michigan State and received his MA and JD from Harvard. Next to me is Professor Bill Jacobson. He's the Clinical Professor of Law and Director of Securities Law Clinic at Cornell. He has a national reputation as a leading practitioner in securities arbitration. He is also the founder and publisher of Legal Insurrection, um, a political and legal website. Um, after all my January 6th cases, Bill, I gotta say that insurrection <laughs> word kind of sends me shaking a little bit. Um, before uh, joining Cornell's law faculty, he had a successful civil litigation and arbitration practice. He's a graduate of Hamilton College and Harvard Law School. Um, and finally, um, to my um, far left is Dr. Nicholas Lawson. He's a disability advocate and a commissioner on disability rights at the American Bar Association. He is also a Georgetown Law Scholar and writes about disability rights issues within the academic medical and legal literatures. Um, he has a BA from Vassar, an uh, MD from St. George University, and a JD from Georgetown Law Center. Um, we're going to start out by hearing um, five-minute opening statements from each uh, speaker, and then we'll move to uh, discussion and uh, finish up with some questions from you all. So. Uh, certainly, uh, please be thinking about um, whatever questions you may have. Um, so without further ado, uh, Professor Muller. Thank you. Uh, I might run a minute or two past five minutes as we get through. I'm going to try to get 200 years of ABA uh, role in legal education in five minutes. We'll see. Um, in the beginning, there were no law schools. Right? In the United States, the practice of law was for reading law and for being called to the bar and for that kind of training. But by the 19th century, the thought was at universities, let's have a more systematic approach to law. Let's create schools of law within the universities or a standalone law school. And this will provide an alternative path for people who want to learn about the law. Um, and by the late 19th century, uh, the American Bar Association began to encourage sort of the proliferation of law schools and the thought that this would be a better way for getting admission to the bar than the reading law side of things. And it began to develop some, some procedures and some advisory roles about what a good program of legal education would look like. Uh, but it wasn't really until the 1920s when the American Bar Association, again, with it having a footprint across the United States, um, began to develop and encourage schools to sort of get certified or accredited by the American Bar Association. That the ABA would offer this seal of approval of high quality for legal instruction. Um, and as a component of that, they also then encourage state bars to require graduates of an ABA accredited law school as a condition for sitting for the state's bar exam. So in the past, while you might have been able to read law or attend whatever school you wanted, one of the encouragements from the ABA to state bars was to move in the direction of this form of legal education. Um, and very quickly, by the end of the 1930s, most states uh, began to require that you graduate from an ABA accredited law school as a condition of taking the bar. So the first move to think about is the role that state bars play in this process. And again, with the American Bar Association, because it's able to, to approve schools across the United States, it makes it much easier for a Supreme Court managing the bar in Springfield, Illinois, or Austin, Texas, say we don't need to determine what a school in Seattle or a school in Miami or a school in Boston is doing. We're able to sort of understand that the ABA has these standards in place, and that's the condition we place upon it. Not all states do that. California's a little different. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
And then by the 1950s, the Department of Education, or Department of Edu Health, Education, and Welfare, um, or its predecessors, began to get in the business of thinking about accrediting schools on their own. And part of that was uh, coming out of, the, out of the Korean War and the GI Bill, thinking about the role of higher education in the United States more generally in the Higher Education Act of 1965. But the Department of Education wasn't going to be the entity that was accrediting law schools. That would be far too onerous responsibility for it. But it would accredit the accreditors, <coughs> essentially. It would approve accrediting bodies throughout the United States. And that way, when under Title IV, dollars would flow, federal loans would flow, it would flow through those institutions that some independent accrediting body had approved. So the role of the Department <coughs> of Education then, when it sanctions what the ABA has been doing in terms of the approval of, of law schools, is essentially a function not of who's eligible to take the bar, that's on the state bar side, but it's a question of federal dollars and federal funding through those institutions. Um, so the Department of Education's role is somewhat limited in that respect, but obviously the ABA's role is already very significant given what state bars require. Now, not everyone has to go through that process. So I'll take California as a brief example, and I'm sure we'll have some other questions about some of the standards the ABA develops so, uh, over time. Um, but the ABA standards are you know, heavier than other responsibilities, heavier than other standards might look like. And in California, there are a number of California-only accredited schools that are not approved by the ABA but they are approved by other accrediting bodies that allow federal dollars to flow through them. And the state of California will allow you to sit for the bar, but in no other state, unless you've practiced for several years and then some states might let you come in. So another challenge is if you're going to challenge the ABA as a creditor, you have to think about how you solve the coordination problem across the states when it comes to attorney licensure. Um, finally, two vignettes over the last uh, 40 years to think about what's happened with the ABA. Um, in 1995, the Department of Justice different branch of the federal government, came down against the American Bar Association filing an antitrust action against it. The ABA having de facto exclusive authority over accrediting law schools, uh, Janet Reno led a charge in the Department of Justice to say that the American Bar Association standards were too high. They were too onerous. They required too many full-time faculty that were costly. They didn't allow for the creation of for-profit law schools or innovations to legal education that could lower the cost. So in 1996, the Department of Justice entered a new consent decree with the American Bar Association where the ABA would uh, accede to some of these demands and, and seek some supervision over the years. Now, some of these moves, for instance, the creation of for-profit law schools, um, didn't move in the direction that the Department of Justice anticipated. And sure enough, by 2008, with the recession, a uh, significant uptick in law school enrollment, significant questions about student debt and student employment outcomes, uh, led to actually a rather remarkable proposition from the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity in 2016, uh, which advises the Department of Education to tell the Department of Education the American Bar Association was out of compliance with a number of Department of Education regulations and in fact should be suspended from its accrediting authority for one year because it was accrediting too many law schools and it was too easy to accredit <coughs> law schools at this point in time. Um, so all, the Department of Education declined that, but what's happened over the last few years is the ABA has tightened its regulations. Uh, several law schools have folded and collapsed uh, or, or been relegated to non-ABA accredited status. Uh, and so that's kind of where we stand today, thinking about the regulatory environment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Justice Bales. <clears throat> well, um, first, um, Judge, thank you for moderating. I assume the game you were alluding to was the Phoenix Suns-Dallas Mavs, and uh, <laughs> I did stay up and watch that game. Uh, and I, I also want to thank the Federal Society for, for hosting this panel. I think too often today, um, discussion of hard issues kind of devolves into slogans and assertions that are not grounded in fact. And I, I know from past experience that this is a setting where we can have a pointed debate and we'll use words precisely and be attentive to facts and, and try to state our positions based on reasoned arguments. So the ABA Council today, it's 21 members and fewer than 20 staff, oversees nearly 200 law schools in enforcing 54 standards that are intended to ensure that law students obtain a quality legal education. And in that role, the, the council performs well. The vast majority of graduates of ABA-approved law schools pass the bar, they obtain legal employment, and they repay their student loans. So having said that, I want to try to quickly make seven points. Uh, like Professor Muller, I may 
go a bit over five <coughs> minutes, but if I limit myself to about a minute on each point, I'll, I'll try to come close. The first point is that the accreditor is the ABA's counsel for the section of legal education is distinct from the ABA more broadly, both as a matter of law in terms of Department of Education regulations and as a matter of fact, the consul is separate and independent from the larger ABA and its accreditation function. The ABA membership, the ABA leadership does not appoint the consul's members, it does not set its budget, it has independent budgeting authority, and has no role in accreditation. The ABA's House of Delegates can accede to changes in the standards and it can ask the consul to rethink proposed changes twice, but at the end of the day, the consul has sole, sole authority to set the standards. So my first point is that the ABA broadly doesn't have a monopoly in accreditation. Indeed, it doesn't itself play a role in accreditation. The recognized Department of Edu Education accreditor is the consul. My second point is that the consul today is not controlled by law professors, and that was one of the concerns that prompted the Department of Justice lawsuit in 1995. The council has 21 members. No more than half can be current law faculty or staff. The other members include three public members, non-lawyers, although today there are four, a law student member, and the remainder are lawyers and judges, including uh, three current or retired chief justices and the president of the National Conference of State Courts. And, and that composition desirably ensures that the council's activities reflect perspectives not just of the legal academy, but also of the legal profession and the bench and the public more broadly. My third point is that accreditation by the council, as Professor Muller noted, not only relates to student loan eligibility, if you're a DOE recognized accrediting agency, and this applies to higher education broadly, it's not just for legal education, students that attend programs that are accredited are eligible for federal um, student loans, but also approval by the council, often confusingly termed just ABA approval, is accepted by 51 jurisdictions across the nation as meeting the minimum education requirements upon graduation for admission to the bar. So a graduate of an ABA-approved law school is accepted by those jurisdictions by decision that's jurisdiction-specific as having the minimum education <coughs> requirements. Um, fourth, that means that the ABA Council as a creditor has multiple constituencies. Students, insofar as getting an ABA degree means they have something that's portable, they can take to jurisdictions across the country. They're given some assurance that they've had an opportunity for a sound education. It qualifies them for student loans. It also gives them consumer information because the council requires regular reporting by law schools <coughs> on various factors. The DOE is an important um, constituent. It reapproves the ABA Council every five years, and its goal, of course, is ensuring repayment of student loans by ensuring that students at accredited institutions truly do get a sound education. State Supreme Courts are constituents because we don't have to be in the business of making case-by-case -case assessments about whether a particular school delivers adequate legal education, and, and state Supreme Courts do that with respect to foreign law schools and in some instances with respect to non-accredited schools. Fourth important constituents is the law schools and the faculty themselves because the process of accreditation and continuing review promotes quality of, among law schools and also gives them information through the reporting requirements. And then finally the public because it's meant to ensure that so long as we're giving people a general license upon graduation to practice law, to affect people in the range of their lives, the, the um, supervision that's entailed with accreditation is meant to ensure, again, that that's a sound legal education. Now, Professor Muller has already touched on my sixth point, and that is, strictly speaking, the ABA doesn't, or the ABA Council doesn't have a monopoly on accrediting schools. Schools are not required to be accredited. Law students are not required to 
attend accredited schools. There are a few dozen non-accredited schools around the country, largely in California, but also there's one in Birmingham, Alabama, another in Nashville, Tennessee, and one in Massachusetts. And across the country, um, lawyers who've been admitted for some period of time can often obtain admission in, an, in a state without respect to whether they've gone to an ABA accredited law school. And, and in some states, particularly California, there is a significant number of graduates of non-accredited law schools who seek admission. Two more points. Um, the consul continually is assessing the standards and its processes to try to improve them. So for example, law schools need to be fully reapproved periodically. We've extended that from seven to 10 years because it's an onerous process. And in the interim, we've developed flags for more frequent or interim monitoring so that if a school's uh, experiencing a large rate of um, attrition or low percentage of its students are, gra are passing the bar, we can focus attention more immediately to try to address those problems. Another example is the adoption of a requirement of bar passage. That was something that was put in place just over um, the last several years. Another more recent example is we helped law schools pivot immediately when in the spring of 2020 they needed to shift to online um, programming, which is something that's generally very limited under DOE regulation in the, in the standards. Finally, breathlessly, that brings me to what everyone came for, 206 and 303. Um, <clears throat> standard 206 has in one version or another been in the standards for 40 years. It's the diversity mandate. It was initially cast in terms of a directive that schools afford full opportunities for legal education for groups that had been subjected to discrimination, particularly ethnic and racial minorities. The revised standard that is expected to go into effect later this year includes a um, diversity mandate for underrepresented groups with respect to faculty, staff, and students. Um, it doesn't mandate quotas. It doesn't mandate um, racial balancing. It uh, does not require schools in states like California that prohibit consideration of, of race or ethnicity in admission or employment decisions. It, it doesn't require them to violate those kinds of prohibitions. So it to my mind, it's not a radical proposal, although it's not surprising in the current context that it's excited a lot of controversy. 303, um, as I think the judge said in his introduction, is a recently adopted requirement that as part of the program of education, law students receive some education on the topics of bias, cultural competency, and racism. The standard doesn't specify the content. It doesn't require that it be in a class. It's just that there be some education on those topics. <clears throat> to me, that goes to fairness and inclusion within our law schools, but it also goes fundamentally to competence of lawyers. Bias, um, judges and lawyers generally are under ethical rules that prescribe the manifestation of bias <clears throat> in their professional activities. Cultural competency goes to just being able to deal effectively with people from different backgrounds, and that's increasingly important in our increasingly diverse society as reflected by the fact that cultural competency training is required widely in healthcare professions, law enforcement, and in other fields. Finally, with respect to racism, it struck me that last summer when the Supreme Court issued its opinion in the case Brnovich versus DNC, a Voting Rights Act case, both the majority and the dissent agreed that all Americans should know our history of denying the right to vote for racially discriminatory reasons and the ultimate passage and effect of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. It also reminded me of President Lincoln, who compared the Constitution and slavery to a man who had a cancer or an illness that he concealed, but he was afraid to cut out, cut, out, cut out lest he bleed to death. Now, both the Supreme Court and Lincoln's quote recognize that law, indeed our Constitution itself, can promote racism or it can combat it. 
I think that's a fact that it's important that we generally recognize, but certainly as lawyers, as people pledge to commit a constitution that guarantees equal protection and more broadly aspires to justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Bales. Professor Jacobson. I, I thank you uh, and thank the Federalist Society for inviting me. This is the second time I've spoke at the Federalist Society in about a month. I think maybe I'll have to join at some point. <laughs> uh, I'm also very honored to be on such a distinguished panel uh, and uh, look forward to our discussion. My own personal relationship with the ABA has been a little bit attenuated. Um, I thought I dropped them like 20 years ago because I did not appreciate the leftward dr drift of the organization, but I recently found out, like preparing for this, that actually I've been a member because Cornell pays for my membership. <laughs> and they all, and the, what got me to inquire is I got an email from them um, telling me I now have a free senior membership. I don't appreciate the senior, but uh, my point is that uh, the ABA, I, I think their membership numbers are a little hard to get at. We, I actually asked them for those numbers. They refused to give them to me, but the numbers I've seen bantied around were that something between 10 and 15 percent in that range of American lawyers are members of the ABA, down dramatically from 30, 40 years ago, when I think the numbers, and again, I don't have precise numbers, just the ones we've seen quoted, something in the nature of 40 to 50 percent. So whereas the ABA at one point was a proxy for the American legal prof profession, it is not now. Nonetheless, the ABA, as a private membership organization, has outsized influence. Its model rules are highly influential, even if they don't have the force of law, and its judicial nominee rating um, uh, system uh, also has been extremely influential, but has gotten bogged down in politics, again, because of the perception that it, the ABA has drifted to the left, and therefore Republicans at best consider the ABA uh, ratings to be informational, uh, and I think most people tend to disregard them. Um, so the ABA does not represent me, it does not represent the American legal community, uh, but it has a near monopoly power, not monopoly power, over accrediting law schools because of the function of obtaining federal loans, which is obviously hugely important. Um, I believe every state recognizes an ABA uh, graduates who, uh, or I should say, every state permits graduates who of ABA accredited law schools to sit for the bar, um, and uh, very few states, California, Massachusetts, a couple of others, will recognize local non-ABA accredited students, allowing them to sit for the bar, although that's very limited. And I think the important thing to understand is the council, which is the accrediting part, um, receive that power mostly from the government at both the federal and the state level in different ways, but this is a governmental power that has been bestowed on the ABA Council. And the question is, as long as the ABA, in my view, as long as the ABA, the private organization of attorneys, um, was separate ideologically and in other ways from the Council, I think maybe that could function. What alarmed me about the recent proposals is that it appears that the ABA Council has gotten away from ensuring that students receive the often referred to the building blocks of a legal education, you know, contracts towards the basic concepts of a legal education, and how now has moved into a sociological and a political um, advocacy for certain types of learning. And those may be very good. You may believe in those, but they are very controversial because they've not traditionally been mandated uh, by the ABA. So the question is, in my mind, is the ABA properly using its accrediting power to force a result on law schools? And that has nothing to do with whether you like what they are requiring. The question is, is it appropriate? Um, and I'll give you uh, a, a, an example from Cornell University. This is big Cornell University, but I think it's a good analogy. In the summer, uh, in July of 2020, as a reaction to the killing of George Floyd, many college presidents and many colleges 
rushed to implement so-called anti-racism programs. And in fact, I believe these ABA changes, at least chronologically, emanated from the protests post-George Floyd. I believe the letter signed by 150 deans was dated in July of 2020. So this was a reaction to that societal upheaval um, and it reached Cornell University and the president of Cornell University declared in late July of 2020 that we were gonna become an anti-racist anti campus and that she was going to seek to implement anti-racist uh, educational and training requirements on uh, staff, students, and faculty. She immediate, and she recommend, the recommended reading for that summer was Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, which um, if you've ever read it, is quite a book. Um, and the concerns I have that while the ABA does not require what must be taught, the reality in the real world, in the world that I live in, uh, on an Ivy League campus and in non-Ivy League campuses as well. That is going to be the direction. If you look what the DEI departments teach, if you look what the speakers are, if you look what the departments, and if you look at the ideological uh, philosophy of both law faculty and non-law faculty, um, that is the direction it's gonna go. And I considered that, and I opposed what the president of Cornell University was doing because I felt that was coercive, that uh, there's a big question whether these DEI programs even work, even accomplish their mission. Uh, that's never really been properly studied. But at Cornell, I argued that this is coercion, this is not education. And you're mandating that uh, people take a view of society, that society is systemically racist, that the law is systemically racist, um, and that that is a hotly debated issue. Uh, but by mandating it from the president on down, or in this case from the ABA council on down, you're resolving that debate. At Cornell, the way it played out was actually surprised me. I was very vocal in my opposition to it, and it, the staff immediately had training requirements imposed on them because the president could do that, but under shared governance, uh, the president referred to the faculty senate, the university faculty senate, which does have law school faculty on it, the issue of what would be the requirements for students and faculty. And much to my surprise, it pretty much split down the middle. Uh, this is almost an entirely liberal faculty, liberal to left faculty. Uh, most people probably support ideologically this programming, but there was strong opposition uh, from people who by no means are right of center or right wing um, to mandates, to educational mandates on students and on faculty. And there was surprising opposition. Now that, uh, that issue also came a little bit before the law school, although not in as formal a way, um, and there was opposition at the law school to mandates on this. And so the law school took what I call a baby step. They now have recommendations that students take these sort of courses. And, um, and that's, you know, but no mandates. And so uh, this is a hotly contested issue. There's, there's no uniformity of agreement on it. But now that these, the ABA Council has passed 303 and will be passing um, 206, which does have an educational requirement in it, um, I think one of the specific things in there is continuing education for faculty members regarding the effective use of diversity in the classroom. That's not mandated. There's, they have a menu of things that can happen, but we, we know what's gonna happen. So the ABA, what they have done, the ABA Council, if they, ha they have waded into a, an issue and a dispute as to mandated education uh, on which there is no consensus even in law schools. Some law schools have these requirements, others don't. I believe most don't. And so my feeling is that it was inappropriate, it is inappropriate for the ABA to use the, the power the government has given to it to advance one viewpoint as to these sort of educational mandates and not to let it play out. Uh, and that to me is extremely serious because as one of a very, very, very small number, small number of open conservatives on campus, um, there is a, an ever-increasing narrowing of the acceptable discourse on campus. We've seen 
law professors hounded out of classrooms, particularly uh, post-George Floyd. We've seen a lot of faculty under attack. We've seen students under attack. There is an ever-narrowing, uh, uh, when it comes to issues of race, dissent is no longer um, permitted. Everybody has good intentions. Everybody wants to minimize racism in society, but how we get there is hotly disputed. And so in my view, the ABA Council has stepped out of its lane. It has injected itself in resolving a hotly contested dispute, and I think, I don't want to go on too much longer, I think it's time to reconsider the near monopoly power that has been given to the ABA um, Council, and maybe in Q&A we can talk about that. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Lawson. Hi, everyone. Um, so I don't think Judge McFadden mentioned, uh, I do, I am a person with a disability. Uh, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, so I don't speak for the ABA or its Commission on Disability Rights. Now, I am a white male, but just FYI. So the disability population tends to be more racially and ethnically diverse than the general population. So I generally approve of many aspects of the ABA Council's DEI standards, uh, but there's a number of things that I strongly object to. So I'm gonna talk about two. Uh, so one, I object to its decision to craft the standards so that they effectively exclude women, LGBTQ people, persons with disabilities, and persons from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, two, is that they never mention law school's obligations to engage in employment affirmative action under the Rehabilitation Act, so this is disability, EO 11246 on the basis of race, ethnicity, sex, and others, and VEVRA on the basis of veteran status. So in general, though, I don't think that there are any viable alternatives to the ABA solo creditors uh, of law schools. I'm going to start with my two main objections and then end with why I still support the council right now. Um, so the newly, uh, so first object, so the newly proposed version of standard 206, so it exempts law schools from responsibility for annual questionnaire results that show lack of inclusion of persons with disabilities, LGBTQ people, women, and others. So according to the ABA's data right now from the questionnaire, so there are schools where women make up only 17% of full-time faculty. Um, and only a third do they make up the rates in the general population. The newly proposed version of 206 says that, uh, that law schools don't need to worry about it. Um, now, out of the council's five officers right now, so this, these things can, can change in terms of the council makeup, four to the five are men. The current chair and the chair elect are both men. The proposed revision also exempts law schools for questionnaire results that show lack of inclusion of LGBTQ folks, even though they lack civil rights and anti-discrimination protections that other marginalized groups enjoy. So there are no known LGBTQ council members right now, but there have been in some in the past. The proposed revision also exempts law schools from responsibility for questionnaire results that show lack of inclusion of people with disabilities who make up over 30% of the adult population, according to the U.S. Census. So I just graduated from a law school last year, so Georgetown, where only 1.2% of its full-time faculty identified as having a disability. So at UC Berkeley, it's 2.1%. <coughs> I guarantee that when we get these questionnaire results on, on disability back from each law school, the council hasn't allowed them to be included on the questionnaire until now, we're going to see tons of zeros for disability. So no faculty identifying as persons with disabilities. What the council is saying is that law schools don't need to worry about it, that they're, they're off the hook, don't worry if your questionnaire results come back and you have zeros for disability. Uh, so why? So the council, so there's a lot of public record about this, has been has consistently trivialized the significance of very low numbers on disability inclusion and other groups. Um, so there are 21 members of the ABA Council now. So the managing director says he, he isn't aware of a single current or formal council member with a disability. He's been there since 2015. He's not aware of any persons with disabilities out of the hundreds of people that the council gets to work on accreditation standards and site visits. It's not like there's a dearth of highly qualified nominees with disabilities available. I don't know why the council seems to think that this doesn't matter. So poverty and socioeconomic status figure nowhere in the council's DEI frameworks. Now, I'm gonna take a wild guess that most of the current council members didn't grow up poor. Uh, 
So my second objection is that they exempt law schools for noncompliance with affirmative action obligations under Section 503 EO 11246 and VEVR. So I imagine that most law schools are federal contractors, and so they're required to comply with these obligations. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it seems like the council doesn't want law schools to be aware of these obligations. They don't figure to the standards. Now, maybe they prefer the affirmative action framework that currently exists in the student admissions context. Um, maybe they don't want to make law schools aware of Section 503 because then they'd have to include people with disabilities. <clears throat> but I think that all the covered marginalized populations end up hurt by the council's decision to keep uh, schools in the dark about these rules. So I currently still support the council uh, in spite of all this, and I'm willing to give it another shot to get the DEI standards right and support uh, for now its continued role as sole accreditor because I think that the populations of marginalized people, including BIPOC, LGBTQ, disability, women, indigent folks, are better than this. Representation and inclusion matters. I know how awful it is to go to a school where you can't find a single law professor who's out with a disability, let alone a mental health condition. It creates a breeding ground for myths, fears, and stereotypes, and there are tons of myths, fears, and stereotypes about people with disabilities, particularly people with mental health conditions like me, that circulate wildly in Georgetown law among its faculty and that pervade throughout society, the legal system. This is not good for legal education or society. And I'm sure it's no different for folks from other marginalized populations, and this is why we need to get the DI standards right. So I also believe that so there are no good alternatives. I also believe the importance of talking to people from all different backgrounds and viewpoints, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, one reason I don't like the idea of separate accrediting bodies is that I think it doesn't make people talk to each other. I don't like the idea of creating separate <clears throat> islands of accrediting universes where people go about things their own way. Now, about the leading alternative accrediting agency, the Western Association of Colleges and Schools. So apparently, none of its accredited law schools met the minimum ABA passage rate for, of 75. One had a bar passage rate of 9%, and another has only two full-time faculty. So just a note allying, uh, allying conservative concerns. Um, I think that the DEI standards seem unbelievably weak. Um, looking at a, at a hearing transcript from 2016, there were zero institutions that the ABA withdrew accreditation from over the prior five years. So uh, the idea that the ABA is going to cause any serious trouble for a law school for noncompliance with a DEI standard seems far-fetched. Uh, and they also effectively let law schools off the hook for data that reveals exclusion of people with disabilities, LGBTQ folks, and women. So even for racial ethnic minorities, so there are three schools right now that have zero full-time faculty from racial ethnic minorities. There are 20 schools that have numbers less than 10%, and this is in comparison to their 40% prevalence in the general population. There are 23 schools where less than 3% of their first year class identifies black compared to 13% of the population. 15 schools where less than 3% identifies Hispanic in comparison to 18%. Even for these schools, I look at the DEI standard and I think that schools could do virtually nothing and get away with it. And the ABA Council does schools a huge favor by keeping them in the dark about the affirmative action rules for federal contractors. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Um, wanna, I, I have some questions for you all, but wanted to give you all an opportunity to respond to one another and maybe to kick things off, wanted to ask you, Scott, maybe to um, reply to Bill's concern that sure, you know, you talk about cultural awareness, bias, these are great terms that can mean a number of things, but in the real world uh, and in real law schools, these end up being uh, kind of code words for a, a certain political agenda. And then also um, kind of separately, obviously Nick has raised some concerns about um, the under-inclusiveness of the, the standards that the council has imposed. Sure. Um, you know, with respect to the, the mandate that there be um, some education on the topics of um, bias, cultural competency, and racism, I, again, the, the ABA, um, I should say, it, it did this um, partly 
as a result of the, the letter from 150 deans that, that um, Bill mentioned, but it, it did so only after a fairly extended process of notice and comment, and that's typical of the ABA Council's um, revisions to its standards. It, it often will hold um, roundtables, it'll solicit input from um, law schools and otherwise, and then uh, the standards committee will recommend to the council that it post for notice and comment a proposed change. That um, then is digested before the council ultimately takes any action, and, and that happened with, with regard to 303. Um, that the council was careful um, to, to be explicit that it wasn't mandating the content or the delivery on these topics. But it, it, it's hard for me to imagine that a, a, a lawyer today could effectively begin practice without any education on those topics. I would hope, well, first, I think it's almost certain you're going to see a fair amount of diversity across law schools in how they approach this. Um, I would, if I were a law dean, I would strive to, um, in my law school, uh, with the faculty, encourage a diversity of approaches within my own school, because one thing that evidence suggests is that if you're, if you're looking at the effectiveness of kinds of diversity, equity, and inclusion training, elected classes are more effective than mandatory classes. Um, but, you know, I, I can't comment on the internal politics at a particular law school. Um, I, I don't know that. Um, I, I hear what Bill's saying, that uh, there's a concern that this, this mandate will, in effect, be captured by a particular perspective. Um, that's not, that wasn't the intent of the council in, in adopting the revision to 303. Now, with respect to Nick's comments, um, he's, he's, he's an effective advocate, and I, I respect and understand the intensity of his views. I don't, I don't agree with his characterization of um, how the new 206 will work, and I, th I think he understates the attention that the council has given to, to issues related to disability rights. Um, the existing standards, 205 is an anti-discrimination and equal opportunity mandate. That includes protections for um, the disabled community. There are uh, provisions in existing 207 and, and standard 702 with respect to reasonable accommodations. Um, 206, as currently written, talks about um, schools needing to take concrete actions to achieve diversity with respect to race, ethnicity, and gender. So it's a fairly narrow um, definition. Talks more broadly about affording full opportunity to underrepresented groups, which by inference would em embrace um, the disabled. Revised 206, which partly was prompted by schools asking for clearer guidance, um, in, in some ways expands the um, requirements because it talks about full access for um, education for, for uh, people from underrepresented groups. It talks about diversity um, in terms of including underrepresented groups among faculty and staff and, and underrepresented groups more expressly now includes people with disabilities. So if you, if you, one way of interpreting Nick's comments are while revised 206 goes further, it doesn't go far enough. His, his suggestion that because currently the annual questionnaire that schools submit that identify among other things, diversity among students and faculty and staff, because those questionnaires do not currently include um, questions about disability, that, that the standards aren't going to be enforced with respect to disability. 
I, I disagree with that inference. And I also would say that the questionnaire is evolving and there will be questions in the coming year that go to disability as well as some other classifications. Thanks, Bill. Um, Derek. Yeah. Yeah, I would just want to jump in on the uh, uh, 303 point because I think um, there's some truth in both Scott and Bill's points that are that are sort of happening out there, and I think the question is what's going to happen in the next several years uh, in terms of the implementation of this. Um, so in terms of the, the requirements for training of bias, cross-culturality, and racism, um, at the beginning of the program of legal education and one other time um, during legal education, um, I think most law schools already do that at orientation. I don't know that there's too much that's going to change at all, if, except that it's sort of a codification of an existing precedent. And then the question is, what do you do with that extra component about what's happening during law school? And there's a reason why, why did 150 law deans write the ABA? Um, you know, because the political economy reason would be look and say, well, why don't you do this at your own school? The problem is, the dean's not in charge, <laughs> the faculty are in charge. And so if the deans can't get the faculty to move or are reluctant about the faculty moving, the deans can go to the ABA and when the ABA does something, the deans can come back and say to the faculty, well, now the ABA has said it. Now, that, doesn't, that, that, that emphasizes the ABA standards are quite minimal. Like, as I construe them, right, you could meet this with a 60-minute lecture on racism, cross-cultural competency, and bias uh, in your first year, you know, mid-October, two months after orientation, and it would seem to meet those minimum standards. But undoubtedly, as Bill's pointing out, and this predates actually the passage of 303, I mean, schools are instituting new core requirements or new requirements on students and curricular requirements that are maybe not just one credit but multiple credits long, uh, potentially offering some things that look more ideological than the things that are within sort of the, the broader ambit of the ABA's rules. So I think the proof is in the pudding to see in the future how the schools implement these things uh, again, it's easy now to say, well, the ABA makes us do it. Um, that's going to be half true at some places because there are a lot of things that are going to go above and beyond what the ABA requires, and so we're going to see how that plays out on an institution-by-institution -institution basis. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Bill, I wanted to give you a brief rebuttal. Sure. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, uh, I don't question the intentions of the Council. I don't view it as bad intent, but my concerns are how I th see it playing out. So um, I do think that what you're going to see is a lot of people saying, as um, was indicated, the ABA is making us do it, okay? The, the argument that you've been making that we can't mandate something is over. We need to get accredited. And it doesn't matter whether the ABA, in fact, would punish a school for, for not meeting it. It's that imperative uh, and it's that <coughs> appeal to higher authority that um, is going to make any arguments I have as to why this is actually a bad thing, this is actually counterproductive to force people to go through this sort of training and this sort of education, uh, is, is going to take away any ability to dispute that. Um, I think that what we're seeing at many universities, certainly at Cornell and at Cornell, Univers at Cornell Law School, is to even apply for a job, you now have to submit a DEI statement. It's an ideological screening mechanism. Now, of course, if you read the, you could, you could submit a statement that's saying, well, I am coming here because I want to be the only outspoken conservative and you need more of those voices. You won't even get, you won't get hired. Everybody knows that. It, it, so there's this aura of DEI mandate, this aura of DEI statements, and it is very ideological and it is narrowing and, you know, it, and students feel the pressure. Students feel the pressure. Um, uh, many law school uh, law reviews have now required DEI statements uh, and have minimized the impact of grades and things like that. So my concern is that this is taking a bad situation and of ideological uniformity uh, and that you are going to get like you do at colleges, you know, Kennedy style, uh, you know, trainings, um, which are, in my view, counterproductive. Uh, but whether you think those are good or bad, why is the ABA Council doing this? That's the, that's the issue that I have. Uh, and why is the force of their accrediting power 
behind this. They could have let it alone and let law schools figure it out. I think cross-cultural competency is valuable. I think there are many things that are valuable. After 22 years in private practice before joining Cornell, I think if you uh, taking courses in psychology would be extremely helpful in dealing with colleagues and clients. Uh, it would be a good thing, but it's not mandated. So there are a lot of good things. Uh, and nothing I'm saying is that people shouldn't take these, be allowed to take the courses. So if you want to take a course in law school on critical race theory, fine. If you want to take the a regular ABA's programming on uh, critical race theory, which is offering a whole program now, fine, take it. It's the mandating that I have the issue with. Um, Nick, you've got an interesting perspective. As I, as I alluded to, you've not only uh, gone through uh, law school, you're also a medical doctor and um, have some insights into how the, the, the medical profession has uh, regulated itself. I, I'd love to hear what, um, is there an ABA equivalent in the, the medical community and, and are there similar efforts um, to, to uh, bring uh, such standards um, in the, the medical community? I'm glad you asked me that, Judge McFadden. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, so the, the equivalent is the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. So it is the sole accrediting body for MD schools. Its parents' organizations are the AMC and the AMA. Um, so they have, it's easy to, I don't know if this is going to be on the camera, but they have this data collection instrument, and they're equivalent, of a, uh, sort of roughly an equivalent to standard 206. So they let... Uh, medical schools pick mission-appropriate diversity categories. So they p pick their own categories for medical students, faculty, and senior administrative staff, and you can pick different ones for each. So now, with respect to the faculty, so here they, they say, uh, you know, pick your diversity categories, provide the specific diversity categories, medical students, faculty, and senior administrative staff. So now, uh, just this is my opinion, that for faculty and senior administrative staff, that this is inappropriate. Um, so academic medical centers, they're federal contractors, so they're legally required to be engaging in affirmative action, have placement goals or higher benchmarks for people with disabilities, racial ethnic groups, women, and veterans. Now, if you're a medical school, I don't see how you can say on the one hand, you know, I don't consider disability to be one of the specific diversity categories that guide uh, recruitment and retention activities for my employees, like faculty and senior administrative staff, and at the same time say, yeah, I'm, I'm complying with my obligations to take affirmative action to recruit, hire, and promote, and retain employees with disabilities. So now, well, the ACME, the LCME does give academic medical centers a choice in terms of defining diversity categories. So the reality is that the targets of their programs, uh, so it's African Americans 97% of the time, uh, Hispanics or Latinos 90% of the time, women 74% of the time, individuals from a low socioeconomic status 53% of the time, LGBT 41%, disabilities 29% according to data. So this is just what are the consequences, what, what white things look like if you gave choice to folks. Um, uh, so that they, the, historically the LCME and these entities, they do give hints about, sort of hints about the diversity categories that should be included. Um, they do have an equivalent to standard 303, uh, so they require schools to provide, quote, opportunities for medical students to learn to recognize and appropriately address biases in themselves, in others, and in the healthcare delivery process as well as, quote, courses and clerkships that prepare students to be aware of their own gender and cultural biases and those of their te peers and teachers. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I, we are going to give folks an opportunity to ask questions uh, in a minute here. I've got more questions, but um, if, if you've got one, I um, want to hear from you in a moment. Uh, before I uh, open it up to the floor, though, um, Derek, we are at the Executive Branch Review Conference. Um, several of you have mentioned the role of the Department of Education, Department of Justice. Um, if there was a, um, you know, a, a 
Republican administration, or frankly, uh, you know, any administration. It, it sounds like you know the the Clinton administration brought a um, antitrust suit against the ABA back in the '90s that um, was, you know, shared some of Bill's concerns. Um, is there much that the the executive branch could do um, unilaterally, or is is the kind of the um, this uh, the, the the horse out of the, the barn. I mean, it's pretty tough. I, there are a lot of um, rules, again, it's like standards about standards that are in the Department of Education guidelines because they want to make sure that the accrediting bodies, because there are dozens of accrediting bodies in the United States, right? So it's not just for the ABA, that these accrediting bodies have procedures in place for how they accredit their schools. They're maintaining high quality, they have adequate staff to supervise and so on. Again, there was this tension back in 2016 about whether or not the ABA was doing its job adequately within that framework. And there was actually agreement in the Department of Education saying like, you didn't comply with these things, you've got 12 months to get your, your ducks in a row, and the ABA did and sort of demonstrated compliance with it. Um, but it's very hard, I think, under the existing regs to exert significant pressure, pressure to say, well, the, the, the specifics of what you're doing or the substantive guidance you're giving to these law schools is inappropriate. I think that that becomes a much trickier thing uh, for the Department of Education to do. So I think it's very difficult to unwind that, at least in the Department of Education side, um, without affecting a host of accrediting bodies and how they go about their work in the United States. And again, the, the, the major question is, when the Department of Education made this decision in the 50s and 60s, it was, we are not developing the rules because we're the federal government and shouldn't be developing these dictates, right? These are things that these accrediting bodies are doing, and we're just making sure they're okay with it. So if you want the Department of Education to have a lot more power that way, well, I mean, maybe it depends on who you think is running the Department of Education in a given year about whether or not you think that's a wise move. Thank you. Uh, Scott. I, ju I just wanted to add a, a few points to that great overview. Um, the, the Department of Education today it actually accredits 60 different accrediting agencies, and, and I'm not sure what the rationale was for its choice to accredit the accreditors rather than to itself um, accredit institutions beyond the fact that there are a lot of higher education institutions in the United States. And as, as Derek said, if you're thinking about alternatives, you know, the prospect of the Department of Education directly accrediting institutions to me at least, isn't very appealing and it's also very not, it's not very practical. But the, the Department of Education actually has, as you'd expect, pages of regulations in the, in the Code of Federal Regulations that are the requirements for the accrediting agencies generally. And it, it doesn't purport to give the, the ABA or the American Psychological Association for that matter or the board that accredits medical schools, it doesn't purport to give them a monopoly. I mean, someone else that wanted to jump through all the DOE hoops could, could try to qualify as an accreditor. But again, you're then duplicating uh, uh, the production of what in essence is a public good in terms of the accreditation collection of information in that process. And it, it strikes me as not very feasible. Um, I'll stop it down. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I will preface this by saying I'm a young female lawyer. I'm aware there's work to be done. I have friends who have the stories of going to the depositions and being asked by the older male partners to pour the coffee, even though they're the ones about to take the deposition. On the other hand, I'm also really aware of the unintended consequences of this, I likewise have female friends who have been told they are only being staffed on cases because they are female, or who have issues getting mentorship from older male partners because everyone is hyper aware of any sort of appearance of impropriety. And so my concern, while I think some of this is well-intentioned, is how does the ABA implement this rule without stifling free and fair thought in debate. I advise a lot of um, FedSoc chapters on law school campuses. A lot of them have horror stories about working with the current DEI um, administration and being hauled in front of them even though they're the ones being attacked by other student groups. And as a lawyer, it's essential that we're able to debate and test ideas. And so for those of you who favor or oppose it, 
what are the concerns about implementation and how does the ABA go forward with this and still protect an atmosphere of free thought? Great question. Um, Scott, do you want to? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer that in um, both a specific and a general way. Um, the, the 303 interpretations specifically say, or maybe I'm confusing it with 206, I think it's 303, specifically says that, um, yeah, now that I'm thinking, it is, it's the proposed 206 comments where there's reference to the um, diversity and inclusion programs and, and disclaims any um, suggestion that there's, that it's, it's meant to dampen the ability of people to speak on controversial topics. And that goes to the more general point about academic freedom, which I think also Bill in his comments touched on. Um, I, think, I think there is a legitimate concern for academic freedom in the context of law schools and higher education more generally. I think we, uh, th there's a tendency sometimes to think of academic freedom too narrowly as something that belongs just to law faculty as opposed to the broader um, educational community. And I, and I think on the other hand, there's sometimes a tendency to think of academic freedom um, too broadly as, as suggesting that a, a professor ought to be entitled to teach whatever they want in whatever class <laughs> they might be offering. And it doesn't, people recognize it doesn't really mean that. But I, I and, and I think um, the ABA has other standards um, that are, are now tied to faculty that relate to academic freedom. And they, they tend to be cast in terms of, well, we need to require tenure or security of position in order to protect academic freedom. And my own view, at least, is that as we're looking at the standards, we should think more broadly about academic freedom as extending also to students and others in the law school community. And, and we need to think about how you protect people from being um, punished for stating views on controversial topics. And, and I, I think both, I think that's been under some tension from groups on both sides of the ideological spectrum and it's something we should be concerned about. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip out of turn here because I think what you said is uh, really very relevant to uh, the questioner over here. Uh, Mr. Shapiro. <laughs> uh, Ilya Shapiro from Georgetown Law, sort of. Um, <laughs> uh, so not about DEI specifically, but picking up on this academic freedom and free speech point. Um, I've been obviously uh, speaking on a lot of panels lately, FedSoc and otherwise, about freedom of speech on campus. Uh, and several deans have approached me in good faith and, and asked for suggestions on how to better inculcate the values of, of free speech and academic civil discourse and what have you. Uh, I don't know whether the ABA can or should be playing a role in that, uh, but do any of you all have suggestions for, similar to how law school deans have been incul inculcating DEI values, um, you know, free speech and, and civil discourse values can be transferred to the next generation of law students. One of our two professors want to chime in there? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think this is specific to the ABA Council accreditation issue, but I think one of the most negative thing developments, particularly post George Floyd, is the propensity of deans and presidents of universities to denounce people. Um, it and to uh, enforce an I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah. Um, we both don't know anything about that. Um, so, uh, and that's one of the most negative things I've seen, um, that uh, all a dean needs to say is this is within the professor or the scholar's academic freedom, period. Um, not included denunciation, and it's been taking place in many different institutions to varying degrees. So I don't know that that has anything to do with ABA accreditation, but it does have to do with a culture of weak administrators who would rather uh, placate what in many cases are internet mobs than, or students um, feeding off of this um, and don't play the role of adult in the room and just want to placate people. 
Again, I don't think that has anything to do with the ABA Council or the standards that have been proposed, but it's one of the most disturbing things I've seen in the last two years. Derek, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, this is a really hard question because, um, this is why you asked it. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that has been most valuable to witness, and unfortunately I'm not sure that this is growing and if anything it might be shrinking, is to see faculty members on the faculty engaging with each other publicly and disagreeing in good faith in front of the student body. Um, so we have faculty workshops where you can see that often happening at, at a very high level, but that's an intimate experience in the College of Law faculty. It's not going to be something that the students see. But to the extent that students can see engagement on different issues with faculty who disagree substantively on things um, in front of that student body, um, you know, sometimes they'll see it at a federal society debate, where, but it's usually somebody from outside the school who's brought in, or sometimes it might be a moderator. Um, but I think that's another way of helping to think about what civil discourse looks like, what um, people on the faculty who can disagree and maybe in some surprising ways look like, and again, patterning that for students. Um, but again, I don't know how much of that is sort of valued as much in institutions or even among many faculty members. I think it's a, it's a question about what that commitment looks like. You all have been waiting patiently over there. Let me Thank get you. Uh, Thank you. Greg Dolan from the University of Baltimore. and to take a brief opportunity saying that it does, I suppose, as a shout out to my own dean who is a liberal and Democrat in good standing, former DOJ official in the Obama administration, who's taken a very hard stance for freedom of speech and when we did have the flare-ups actually sent emails to the faculty. So it, it does, and it does help. We haven't had those flares. But here's my question mostly dealing with kind of this idea of ABA monopoly. Given that most law schools tend to lean to the left. Imagine a hypothetical world where there are two or three accrediting bodies in competition with one, with one another, all of whom would be, accrediting from any one of them would be sufficient to sit for the bar, right? There would be the ABA and some conservative bar association and whatever else. Given that, again, the faculties and the deanships in law schools tend to lean left, how many of them would you think choose to be accredited by the, this hypothetical conservative bar association as opposed to by the ABA? In other words, is the monopoly really a problem if it would persist on a voluntary basis? Yeah, well, I think that raises the issue of what would come after the ABA. Uh, and uh, I think what need, where this probably needs to start is at the state level. States could, and in some states it's the state Supreme Court, some it's uh, a, a special, you know, board of bar overseers, it varies state by state, but uh, if they were to loosen the requirements, if they did not require that a student graduate from an ABA accredited school, but perhaps graduated from a law school that is accredited by at least one other state or by one other recognized authority, that would be a good first step. I think it's a very viable step. Uh, people still need to pass the bar exam. They still need to graduate from law school. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, and so I think the pl this is something that could be amenable to uh, state action because nothing's going to change for uh, at least until 2024, 2025. Um, so, but states could act now. States could loosen the requirements. Uh, and I think that would have a positive effect. And uh, whether somebody can create a viable alternative uh, accreditor, uh, who, which would have the quality standards of the ABA, uh, but be a competitor, is something we'd need to see. But doing nothing just because it's been done this way forever, I don't think is the right approach. Well, I, so I was gonna chime in, not on, on your point, but, but I do agree that there is some uncertainty um, about what reduces bias. So there's a lot of debate so in the disability community, especially in terms of mental health stigma. You know, so there are people who persist in this thinking about that knowledge reduces stigma. That uh, there are people who, who for example, uh, would argue that you know, teaching people that schizophrenia is, you know, is some biological condition and, and people have all sorts of conceptions about what it is that's gonna reduce stigma. That actually makes things worse. There are things about you know, knowledge about uh, 
mental health and other disabilities that exacerbate stigma. So there is this uncertainty. Now, at the same time, we do have a framework and that there has been a lot of thought that's been developed in you know, the affirmative action federal uh, contractor context. People have, have thought about these things a lot and I guess I, it, it still sort of befuddles me that the ABA wouldn't kind of look to those models. So for example, you know, one way that you can show, you know, as an institution that you are, uh, you know, to reduce, to make people more likely to come out as having a disability is, and this is you know, in the, the regulations, is you put on your website, you know, a picture of Bill Trainer, you know, Dean of Georgetown Law, shaking hands with, you know, a, a provost in a wheelchair. Yeah, the provost, you know, says, uh, hey, you know, people really like me here and, you know, they recognize that we are, you know, uh, you know, vital to this community, or you have a provost, you know, or, or a de an associate dean saying, you know, I grew up with autism, I and uh, but I'm okay. Uh, there's there's stuff that that people have thought about, and and these regulations also recognize that that inclusion and data on inclusion is a gold standard in terms of stigma reduction. So so I agree that there is uncertainty in terms of what reduces bias. I don't understand why people wouldn't look to these existing frameworks, because people have thought about this stuff a lot. Thank you. Um, kind of final question, uh, maybe to you, Scott. Um, a number of us have been following the uh, Supreme Court's um, case in the affirmative, uh, uh, the Harvard Affirmative Action case, uh, Students for Fair Admissions, going to be um, up next term. Um, obviously, none of us knows what will happen with it, but there are certainly suggestions that, that perhaps the Supreme Court would invalidate the, the Harvard Affirmative Action um, program. Um, would that have any implications for uh, standards 206 and 303, or um, do, do you think that's completely different um, issues there? Well, um, and coincidentally, the opening brief, I think, was just filed yesterday, and it, and it now there are two cases, one from Harvard, one from the University of North Carolina, and it's basically a argument that the court ought to overrule Grutter versus Bollinger, the, the case that allowed um, universities to consider race and admissions on the view that diversity is a compelling interest and that so long as uh, race was considered as a factor in a holistic review of an applicant's credentials and, and there was no less restrictive alternative, then it'd be permissible. So um, that's, that's what's at issue in that case that will be argued next year. The, um, the consul, when it approved the revisions to 206, recognized that that, that case was on the horizon and um, decided to proceed, noting that if, if the case law changes in a way that would require revisions to the standard, um, that will happen. And, and that's consistent with the approach under the existing standard and under the revision that basically says if, look, if, if, if a state prohibits the consideration of, of race, for example, this, the standards aren't suggesting that a school has to violate applicable law. Um, but I. I think it's unlikely that whatever the Supreme Court does that it's, that it's going to affect the standard. And I say that in part because, as I noted, the, the revisions don't require um, schools to expressly consider race um, if, if they're in a jurisdiction like California that bars that as a consideration in um, admissions or employment. And, and the Council hasn't interpreted existing 206 or, or the proposed revisions as, as mandating quotas or racial balancing. So I, um, you know, I, the, the standards will evolve to allow schools to, or the standards will evolve so they don't suggest schools have to act contrary to law, which they, they couldn't do. But I, I doubt that that case is going to have an impact. All right, well, as a trial judge, uh, I've learned to try to keep the jury happy and know <laughs> not to stand between them and lunch. So it's top of the hour. Please join me in thanking this panel for a great discussion. <laughs>